Nick Saban's Alabama Crimson Tide gets a big, and I do mean big, commitment for 2025. Locked on Bama, your daily podcast on the Alabama Crimson Tide. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody, and welcome back into Locked On Bama. Luke Robinson, that's me. Jimmy Stein, that's him. Jimmy, Alabama gets a big commitment, somewhat out of the blue, really, from a guy ironically named Mason Short when he's 6'7". Um, and uh, he's a four-star kid pretty much universally. Um, some places have him in the top 40, some in the top 70 for 2025 class out of Evans, Georgia. Um, just a humongous human being. And if you look at the picture for this YouTube video and you see, uh, I'm going to put it on here because some people uh, obviously probably can't get that picture. They may be uh, looking at it, you know, listening to it online or whatever, listen to the podcast. I don't know how podcasts work, apparently. Um, but yeah, here's his picture right here. Woo! Look at that. I mean, he's got that is a big dude. Look at, and he looks like a superhero with a baby face. There's some, Avenger, there's some Avenger. I mean, you know, in terms of like a comp, I don't know. Um, the Hulk. I mean, he's and 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 look at the the thin waist. It's an incredible picture. And and look, for Alabama to take a commitment from a kid who's in the tenth grade. I mean, they took one from Ryan Williams, right? Uh, I, I think this is an indication that Alabama feels the same way about Mason Short as they do about Ryan Williams, uh, which is a name uh, I know everyone listening to the podcast knows uh, Mason Short, maybe a name you didn't know until yesterday. But for them to take a 10th grader, and, and he literally is in the 10th grade. I know everybody thinks of him as a junior, uh, but he won't be a junior in high school until August. <laughs> he, he's a sophomore right now. Class of 2025 guys are in the 10th grade until uh, at least until until May. So they're obviously sky high on him. And, and he's he's a good athlete for his size. Um, but look, I think the bigger theme here is, is in terms of yet, here's another gigantic offensive lineman. I know I said gigantic. I, I can't come up with words to describe how big these guys are. Look at the guys in the last class, Form B, Olas, Rock Montgomery, who's apparently bigger than Rock was McElderry, Miles McVeigh. Uh, you know, uh, these are just tremendous. Like Caden Proctor, <laughs> all 300, he showed up at 365. Um, all these guys are just tremendously sized. And now Mason Short, who may be bigger than all of them. I mean, he's six. Uh, Andrew Bone from Bayman Insider talked to him yesterday. He verified to Bone he is currently 6'6, 303, but probably growing almost certainly growing, frankly, certainly weight-wise. Uh, this is a, another huge guy. So what is Coach Wolford and Nick Saban telling us? To me, they're telling us that running the football is not just something the fans want to do. This is something that Nick Saban wants to do. I don't think you get humongous on the offensive line because you plan to throw it a bunch. Those guys need to be in good. If you're going to throw it a lot, offensive linemen like that need to have quick feet, long arms, they need to be in great cardiovascular shape to play a bunch of snaps. They need to be excellent pass protectors, which means being nimble with long arms. Um, what do you look for in, in run blocking offensive linemen? Size, power, the ability to get another 300-pound athlete on skates. That's what they're doing here to me, Luke. They're, they're stockpiling run blockers. That is not to say they're going to abandon the pass game. Of course not. Uh, these guys are all athletic guys. They'll all be capable pass blockers. But but just, you know, in terms of simplifying things and some, I think you sign six foot six, 340 pound offensive lineman to pick up a defensive line and relocate it somewhere else on the field. And that that's uh, Mason Short's just the latest now since uh, Coach Walford's been here, the latest example of big, big, bigger. Lucas speechless. Yes, I'm muted. He was uh, speechless uh, oh, over, <laughs> over the uh, incredible. He's so stupid. He's so stupid. And it's funny. It was a suit rant. 
my astute speech. About it's the so office. funny too because there's a guy um, who listen who apparently hate listens to our podcast because he always <laughs> seems to have negative comments. And he said something like, "Your your little skit about being on mute has gotten old." I'm like, "It's it's not that's what it's not a skit at all. There is <laughs> nothing skittish about it." It is. Um, it's so stupid. I admit how stupid it is that I keep doing this, and, and I wish that I didn't do it. But I do it, and I do it with such regularity that um, Metamucil has called me. It's getting, <laughs> it's getting funnier to me. It's funnier every time. But I got to go back to this picture. I mean, look at this cat, man. I mean, Jimmy, you're not supposed to be, have that v in tenth grade. First of all. It looks like most of that building is on his back. I'm, I'm wondering if, like, this picture is taken at a weird angle and that all those bricks are on his back. That is a huge human being. And his shoulders are, like, popping out from his, his body. Like, they, they're trying to escape. Um, meanwhile, what I think is great, he's got this baby face, so he's going to get even bigger. You know, I hate to invoke this name but it's got it's got uh he's got some bart ralston vibes but in the way we all thought bart ralston would actually be versus right. you know because back in the day when we signed bart ralston i mean everybody was so fired up he was so big and, it, and it, you know he played some but i mean and, and again there's no shame in not being an all-american I mean, he played at alabama it was a big deal i mean he was a he was a player but we all had these incredible high hopes. Um, who was the guy? Um, what was the guy's name that, that was called the um, – Sports Illustrated had him as the the Incredible Hulk, and then they named him the Incredible Bolst, the Incredible Bust. And it was an Incredible Bulk. And then big dude, it, a big dude from Texas, right? Tony Mandrich? No, no, no. He's oh, 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 you're talking about the offensive lineman, Tony Mandrich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking from, about recently. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, from, from Michigan State. He was from Michigan State. Yeah, he was supposed to be the greatest offensive lineman in, in NFL history. That was that's where the bar was set in terms of expectations. Ends up he was uh, eh, one of the Colts' better offensive linemen, sort of. Well, actually, didn't he get drafted by the Packers and it Packers? Just yeah, yeah, and I, th I think I want to say that he eventually ended his career with the Colts and 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 was a pretty good player. You know, it's like when yeah. you're talking about Mark Ralston. It's like. You know, and the thing that, that really sucks, I mean, we talk about the whole show this, it's not like these kids set the expectation bar. Correct. It's not like Bart Ralston said, oh, and by the way, I'm going to be a three-time All-American and a top 10 pick. I mean, I, I mean, I, he didn't say it publicly anyway. I mean, it, adults like us, you know, loser adults like me and you, Luke, loser mm -hmm. adults like me and you, <laughs> set the bar for these kids in terms of, where we set our expectations when they don't reach those expectations, we lash out as if the kid has done something other than not live up to the expectations that adults set for them when they were kids. Uh, it's really, I mean, it's, it's cool to be frank. I mean, and honestly, cool. Jimmy, I think you're wrong in your description of us though. We're not adults. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I need to tell everybody. Good boy. We all have goals. We all have goals. I need to tell everybody about Built Bar. Look, I, I just did this today. Go to Built March Madness and vote. You can still do it. It enters you in an opportunity to win um, a free box of Built or a free box of Built for like a year. So you need to go to BuiltMarchMadness.com and vote for your favorite Built Bar They're to the championship game. Um, you, I'm not going to tell you which one I voted for because I don't want to skew you, but uh, you can go and vote for whoever, and you need to go there ASAP. That's BuiltMarchMadness.com. I'm telling you, these things are awesome. And look, while you're there, buy you some Built Bars. These things are delicious. They're nutritious. They're scrump delicious. I've said that a bunch of times. That's my own line. Built Bar, feel free to throw in a little extra change for me for doing that. Um, but you got to try them. Or Built Bars. Or Built Bars. Yeah, either way. I'll, I'm, I'm good either way. Um, they are, you can buy the built bars, the built puffs. They're all so good. They're covered in hundred percent real chocolate, chock full of protein. You can't beat them with a stick. As my grandfather used to say, you can beat an egg, you can beat a bush, but you can't beat built bars. So go check out builtmarchmadness.com. You will not regret it. You will love it. Go check them out. 
I want to thank everybody for making this your first listen. We appreciate you guys a ton. Um, Jimmy, also a couple of new visitors coming in to Alabama today. These are two biggins uh, from sort of kind of the same area, at least in Georgia. Uh, Air Nolan, the quarterback, who is a four-star, consensus four-star. He is um, in the top 50, top 75 players in the country, just about all the way around. And then Ed Houston, who is a five-star. Both of these are class of 24 guys. Um, Edric Houston is a defensive lineman from Buford, Georgia. He is a he's a badass. I think I can say that as one word uh, and not really get in so much trouble on this podcast anymore. And um, he's fantastic. Would love to have him. He's at Alabama today, along with Aaron Nolan. Uh, I tell you what, I really like the idea of having two quarterbacks in this class because I think you just about to have to have two in every class. Um, of course, Alabama already has Julian Sayan. But, um, you know, if they got Air Nolan, too, I'd be happy with it. Now, he set a commitment date that's not too far away, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I just think this is just my take uh, on Air Nolan is Alabama is hugely satisfied with Julian Sand and very confident that Sand is going to uh, remain committed to Alabama. But in this NIL age, you better cast a wide net. And, and, and by that meaning – Let's have the best relationship with Air Nolan as possible because you never know what could happen with Sand in terms of him flipping, which we don't think is likely. No thing's going to happen, but it's it's nil, right? Uh, and, and also uh, injury or hey, the kid just changed his mind. So your backup plan can't be constructed the day after Julian Sand shocks you by going somewhere else. It has to be constructed now hey if this then that if this then that if that happens then this uh and, and you build that plan and the only way it's going to work is if you have a really good relationship with the kids so you know now that said would alabama take both probably but then you got to worry about you know what, what those two kids think you know quarterbacks is just different recruiting than other positions and you, you sign you can play five offensive linemen you can play four defensive linemen, you can play four linebackers. You only play one quarterback. And, and that's why that position is recruited differently. And it's why some of the kids want to be the only guy in their class because there's only one, one, one ball, right? One, one quarterback. So, you know, last year Alabama was able to sign two top 10 guys, which was very rare. We talked about it at the time. And I think greatly aided by the fact that Lonergan is so interested in baseball. I think that's why that 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 happened, because he wanted to play for the best program possible that he felt was giving him a fair shot at baseball, too. So and Holstein was open to it. Uh, Holstein was probably open to it because at the time we were recruiting Arch Manning and he, if he was good with that. Of course, he'd be good with Lonergan. So, uh, again, another rare bird. So I, I don't think it's about taking two so much as it's about casting a wide net, having a lot having your backup plan, not be plan B, Luke. But plan 2A, like Sand is 1A and Aaron Nolan is 2A, uh, you know, and, and you recruit both kids really hard. And if, if, if Nolan commits somewhere else, you, you try to maintain the relationship with him best you can. Um, so that, that's my take on it. Edric Houston, totally different situation. Somebody that's at the top of the want list, one of the great pass rushers in the 2024 class. He could, he's one of the guys out there, Luke, that can name his school. I mean, uh, Edward Houston could sign with Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, Texas, anybody wants. Uh, he likes Alabama a lot. Alabama recruits Buford High School as well as any high school Alabama recruits in the South. If he goes to Alabama, he'll have buddies here. That's very helpful. And, uh, you know, he's no stranger to Tuscaloosa uh, just with the pipeline, the Buford to Tuscaloosa pipeline, obviously Georgia a major threat traditional schools that recruit at the top of the food chain so uh boy big time visitors you love it when they come to practice because they're on their own dime it's an unofficial trip they want to see how you practice you want to see how they do in meetings uh and, and uh it's all about continuing a relationship one last thing real big it's not just a matter of counting how many visits to campus but one off off the record off grid thing for me that I track all the time is if a kid comes to campus on his own dime 
two or three times in addition to an official visit, I know for a fact that kid is dead serious about Alabama. He may not choose here. It may not ultimately be the choice, but he's dead serious. It's not for show. Uh, it, it's it's a serious, serious candidate. And that's what you're looking at. Aaron Nolan's been here a couple of times. I, I, don't, I don't think Edric Houston has been here too many times, but I don't think this is his first time either. But just track for people out there who love to follow recruiting. Track how many times they come because it's telling you a lot. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt. And look, I mean, it's, it's still a, a popular destination. I mean, Nick Saban's going to be here. I'll tell you what, it, maybe I'm the only one. But I love talking to recruiting as much as anybody. I mean, I've been following recruiting forever. If you follow this podcast, you know that. I mean, I was following recruiting back when I was at Alabama in 92, back before it was popular. But when I see Alabama gets commitment from a 2025 guy, my first thought is not, hey, awesome, can't wait. My first thought is, God knows I hope Nick Saban's here to coach him. And <laughs> I, I know that that, that should – that shouldn't be what the first thing that pops in my head, but it is because eventually all good things must come to an end. Um, but I just, here's hoping that uh, that's something that doesn't come to an end for a while. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, Jimmy, we're going to run down a few odd and end things. So just uh, instead of getting into a whole new subject, I had something, uh, Bama Online put out a good little article about veteran Alabama football players facing make or break off seasons. That's sort of better for a longer section than just one yep. sort of longer segment. So we will save that. What I wanted to bring up was first of all, uh, Alabama baseball, they win one out of three against Arkansas. It's a little bit disappointing because I think they had a shot to at least get two, if not all three. Um, but you know, one out of three playing at Arkansas, number six team in the country, I, I guess we'll take it. If you had said, uh, we'll give you this to start off with. You'd probably say, yeah, I'll take that because you, you certainly would be worried about getting swept. Alabama softball is still doing okay. They win two of three at Missouri. Um, Alabama basketball, they're still looking at all these different transfer guys. Um, still feel good about Charles Bediaco eventually coming back. I know he's testing the waters. I still feel pretty good about uh, JQ coming back. Um, and I would be happy with that. I don't think Alabama's done in the transfer portal in either direction. So um, that's something to think about. But, um, you know, one other thing to consider uh, just randomly, do, do you have any thoughts on the next national championship game? I guess it's Alabama related in the sense that Alabama played them both and lost to them both. I'm going to pull for San Diego State just solely for the, the team that knocked Alabama out. <laughs> so I want them to win the national championship. I won't say that's any sort of vindication on Alabama's part, but it just – will always make the tournament more notable that Alabama lost in the Sweet 16, the eventual national champion. But in terms of what I think is going to happen, I think UConn's going to win by about 20 points because they've beaten everybody else by 20 points. And I'll go back to our game with UConn in November. Uh, Alabama was played in that really tough tournament, beat North Carolina, beat Michigan State, but lost to UConn. And, and, and back then, the type of season that Alabama ended up having being the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament, but I remember saying either on the show or thinking to myself, but I remember very clearly believing when UConn beat Alabama and UConn beat the crap out of Alabama, that I'm like, that UConn team can win the national championship. I really felt they were a national championship contender uh, in terms of how they just thoroughly whipped Alabama. And, and yeah, they've lost a few games this year. They didn't come in a one or a two for that matter. But uh, I think if UConn wins big tonight, uh, we should kind of look at them like that they were the best team all year I don't know what happened during a few losses but that was that was the best team in college basketball period if UConn wins by 20 tonight and, and I, I think they will yeah I think it's going to be tough for San Diego State to keep up with them and and frankly I don't really have a team I'm pulling for to be quite honest I keep forgetting the game is tonight um I know that maybe I've taken some heat of my stance on I think the Final Four is better when you got bigger names. And I know you can say they earned whatever. I just yeah. – um, this is not a sexy matchup by any stretch of the imagination. There's – I mean, there's nobody you can really wrap your arms around. And if you want to talk about uh, demand, I'm looking – I just pulled up StubHub while you were talking. You can get in the game for 44 bucks on StubHub. Now, that's on StubHub. That's not – like outside the stadium, you can probably get in for le a lot less than that. 
So, yeah, I mean, it, it just tells me that there's just not a lot of demand for this game. And um, I'm going to go back to look it sports. Look at the women's final four, for instance, yes. if, if, if San Diego, now if San Diego state had a, uh, the equivalent of a Marshall Falk on their basketball team, I would probably feel a little different, but they don't, they play an ugly brand of basketball. That's not fun. It's obviously successful. Kudos to them. Um, Meanwhile, UConn, Sonogo's good. He's pretty good. But, I mean, would you consider this UConn team an all-timer? Not not even close. So, um, I feel like you look at the women's Final Four, though, you had a superstar in Caitlin Clark. You had uh, two SEC teams that are known to be good and probably one of the best women's coaches of all time over there at LSU, and, and I guess at South Carolina, too. Yep. And then you had, you had four Power Five – conference teams in there and the ratings were through the roof uh the ratings outdrew uh some of the best nba games of the year yeah. so i mean by a long shot so that was the I, most I mean, my that was the most excitement i can ever remember in my lifetime that was the most uh intriguing the most there's more interest in the women's final four this year than than ever before in history it seemed to me clark deserves a lot of credit for that as well as lsu and angel sure. reeves who, who probably did feel uh, understandably disrespected. <laughs> she she is one heck of a basketball player. Not that Caitlin isn't, but I'm just saying Angel Reese is really good. Yeah, and look, I, I, and the fact that people are even talking about the game from last night and that, the, yeah, some of them are talking about the officiating, but, boy, in years past, nobody even brought up the women's game. So, yep. again, I think if you have the bigger, better names, it makes the game better. I, and, again, there's some people who take offense to that because they think – but all we're moving towards I – th- I, honestly, I think here's the deal. Division One college basketball has too many teams. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a little watered down. Let, let's let's cut this thing. Let, let's – if you if we want to have 68 teams, let's get the 68 well, teams we think are best, it's, not the 68 it's, it's teams. It's the portal. It's the portal to me. I, I I think six years ago, vacation because I can't say okay this specific guy and this specific guy. But in the most general of terms, what I think has happened is all the guys that used to sit on the bench at Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke, Indiana, Arizona, and Kansas are now starting somewhere else. They sign with the prestigious program out of high school because it's the sexy thing to do. And then after one year, they see that there wasn't a a golden path to the starting lineup. So their next destination is about one thing. Where can I play? They didn't ask that when they're coming out of high school. (laughs) Out of high school, it's where's the sexiest program I can sign with? Number two, now when it comes time for their next destination, it's about where can I play and still feel like this is big time college basketball. And the answer to that question, Luke, I'll tell you where you can play San Diego state, Florida Atlantic, Butler, Loyola, Chicago. These are places you can play and still obviously achieve great things. So that to me is why the rise of the mid major, the rise of the group of five, the rise of Gonzaga, the rise of Butler, a while back, Loyola, Chicago, teams like that. I think this probably won't be the last time we see San Diego State make a lot of noise in the tournament now. They're a thing now. Uh, it's because it's a it's a it's not a destination school, a second destination school. How about that? Patent pending on that phrase. I dig it. Yeah, I just, I just came up with it. All right. Let's uh, wrap it up, Jimmy. So we will talk tomorrow. And until then, roll tight, everybody. Roll tight.